by Mohit Singh from Georgia Tech, and he will be talking about algorithms for subset selection. Thanks, and uh, thanks for showing up early in the morning. Uh, some of you might be still groggy and thinking whether I've come from the other program huh, over here. But yes, I'll talk about some diverse uh, subset selections and some models, some algorithms and some non-algorithms, and hopefully we some, see some hyperbolic polynomials as well. Uh, let me start by uh, a simple example the kind, and introduce you the problems. Actually, most of my talk, I'll, I'll actually talk about particular applications of the model that I go uh, do, and, and maybe one or two algorithms I will mention. But the, most of the focus will be on like, introducing the model and telling you what the applications are. Uh, and there are lots of problems uh, and open problems that will also uh, will all naturally come out. OK. So, yeah. So the problem I want to look at is try like uh, is to collect like find a subset from a big corpus which is somewhat representative and, and diverse. So like for example, uh, like I give you I want to do an image search. If really want to just want relevant images, these are the kind of images you would like to pick. But if I really want to pick uh, images which are more diverse as well, which kind of have different kind of jaguars in it uh, in some sense, right? Like so that's the kind of thing I would like. And, uh, and these are the kind of things we also decide, like we do every day, and sometimes by computer as well. You give like you can only give 20 questions to a uh, in your exam, and you want to make sure the questions you are giving are diverse and representative of the whole subject that you do. Like and sometimes, like for example, in in many of these uh, automated tested, these are even done online, and depending on how your performance has been so far, and uh, like yeah, depending on that, you will be asked different sets of questions, right? So we wanted to come up with some models for many of these things, and and. Uh, which are mathematically interesting as well. Uh, so one of the things that is done, like is a very nice model is using determinantal point processes. So where uh, what you do is assign a vector to each of your objects, for example, an image. And this vector would, like, would be some kind of a feature vector. So it's somewhat representative of the image in some sense, uh, in some high dimension, r to the d. And then you say, OK, I'll, I want to pick a set of images. And the set of images I will pick, I want to pick vectors which are, in some sense, long, which are useful, which have good features, but also are not pointing in the same direction. So what I will do is try to pick the set of vectors which maximize the volume of the parallel pipette spin right? So in some sense, I want them to be orthogonal uh, as well as long. Uh -huh. So maximize the volume of the parallel pipette like them. And, we'll, and this problem has been actually quite interesting. I will talk a bit more detail about it. Uh, uh, Nima talked some, va some variant of this problem also earlier uh, in the workshop. I'll uh, like talk about cardinality and partition constraints. In this talk, I, won't I will use the word metroid, but it really doesn't matter if you don't know it. Uh, we'll just re I'll define what partition constraints are formally, and that's what will be enough for us. Good. So, and of course, determinant. Oh, so the volume can be represented by the determinant of this parallel pipette. And more generally, what I, the more general model I look at is the following model. I'm going to embed each item in some vector in R to the d, and uh, as a vector vi, I will get. So for every item in my corpus, think of these images. And our goal will be to pick a subset S. And once you pick a subset S, I would actually evaluate how good or bad it is <laughs> by a function which typically will be a spectral function and of this particular matrix. Right. And we'll see why did I pick it. Let, let, for now, let's assume that's what we do. And I'll try to justify why this is a good function to pick. I'm going to minimize some spectral function of this sum of rank 1 matrices of VI, VI transpose inverse of this matrix. Okay. Of course, I could have written the function of this matrix as well. Like, OK, it doesn't matter. But writing in terms of inverse, it's quite nice. And the kind of functions we will look at the most natural functions, the determinant, uh, the trace, and the spectral norm. Right? These are the three functions, but of course, you can ask for any other spectral function as well. But each of them actually have, will have combinatorial meanings. Uh, people have studied them in many different areas, and we'll see some of them as well. Okay. And so this collection C is like all D element subsets? Of Good. The so what are my collection C? We look at a bunch of constraints for them. The simplest one would be maybe a cardinality constraint. I want to pick a subset of cardinality K. Okay. Okay. Fun? Good. Yes. So we will. Uh, yes. So it's in, we will look at cases when k. Yeah. And I guess that's what you have. You have to be caught. <laughs> These are not planted questions. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Let's go slowly. So one. So one. The constraints we look at are mostly cardinality constraints. Um, here, the algorithmically, we I would want to say things are much better understood. 
we will also look at partition constraints. Partition constraints are, I, my ground set will be partition into maybe a bunch of parts. And from each part, I tell you how many to pick. Okay. We'll all, like, of course, more general, these are matroid. This is a matroid, basis of a matroid. You can now even look at more general arbitrary matroids. And some of the theory generalizes, some of them doesn't, and some of them is generalizing as I speak, I believe, right? So uh, with the, a lot of the new uh, uh, developments that we have heard about in this workshop. But mostly in this talk, I'll focus on cardinality and partition constraints. Okay, and as we mentioned, we have to be careful. We are taking an inverse of a matrix. Uh, so if K is bigger than D, Okay, if k, k is a set number of vectors I will pick. If that number of vectors I'm go picking is more than d, then things will be fine. I would expect this matrix. You should be picking linearly independent vectors. I should want you to enforce uh, that uh, this will be an invertible matrix. If k is less than d, then I'm only, it's a rank k matrix at most. So I should not expect to have an inverse. But in some sense, uh, I will uh, uh, put it on the rug, but in some sense, we, you will generalize all of these concepts in terms of elementary symmetric polynomials or their ratios and so on, okay? So that's what we'll focus on. Basically, just ignore the zero eigenvalues, right? If you're picking k, ignore d minus k zero eigenvalues, and after that, you would like take, for determinant, take the product, for trace, take the sum, and so on. Good, Good. that's the problem. We'll, so let's see some, uh, ex like, why is this model interesting? So let me take one problem. Um, uh, so um, actually, before, let me just briefly tell you the outline. Most of the time, I'll talk about some application of these models. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, uh, approaches for the cardinality constraints. And I will say here, we understand the algorithmic questions a lot better. Uh, and they are both uh, approaches based on convex, program, uh, convex programming approaches, as well as combinatorial algorithms, actually. And uh, one uses the, the, them, they work differently in practice and in theory as well, and we'll see some of those results. Approaches for partition constraints and more metroid constraints is more uh, complicated, but here this is where I would say from this workshop's point of view, uh, things fit in, stable polynomials play a crucial role in trying to understand how well can you approximate these problems. Uh, so results by Gurwitz uh, on permanent uh, and the results by Marcus Speedman Srivastava on Carson single conjecture naturally fit it in this framework and can be utilized to solve these optimization problems. And we'll see some of those. And as I said, some of these results are uh, and can be generalized to matroids using uh, all matroids using the machinery of completely locked form concave polynomials, uh, some uh, not clear yet. Uh, the other issue over for general partition constraint will is from a, that most of these results will be non-algorithmic, at least, okay? Some of them might be algorithmic, but mostly they are non-algorithmic, which is a concern as well. So we'll discuss that in more detail. Okay, so let me talk mainly about the application right now, just to understand what is this abstract model capture, right? So, so what, how, what are these vectors? Like how, what can I represent with them and what these functions really mean, right? And these constraints. Good. So let's take uh, the problem of experimental de design and statistics. So what's the, what's the setup? I have some unknown theta star in R to the D, which I want to measure. Okay. I, do, I, have, I don't know what this thing is. What I can do is take a bunch of linear measurements for it. So I can take a linear measurements. I can pick it one vector, V1 through Vn. These are also vectors in R to the D. I can take, uh, every, if I take a uh, measurement with respect to Vi, I get Vi in a product theta star. But every time I do, I also get some noise. Okay. That's my output Yi. And we assume, for simplicity, the noise is actually a Gaussian with uh, mean zero so, and uh, variance delta. <laughs> so you can take a bunch of linear measurements. These are the possible linear measurements you can take. And the goal is to which of these linear measurements should I do? Okay? In statistics, it's called the experimental design problem. Which of the, uh, out of the n experiments, which k I need to do? Uh, the, question, the point is, okay, suppose I do a bunch of experiments. Let's say I do set S of experiments. Then I need to, I, what my goal is to estimate the theta star. How am I going to estimate the theta star? Because everything is quite linear. So in that, that problem is very nicely understood. What you're going to do is, is basically do a least square problem. Okay, that will be your most likelihood estimator as well. So what you're going to do is just put the, put all these vectors which for which you take the take the measurements, put them in a matrix as rows, and just basically find out the uh, least square estimator. The least square estimator you can exactly write down and you can check what the error is. Of course, the error will depend on which measurements you did, right? And then the error will also be a Gaussian, distributed like a, a d-dimensional Gaussian vector, whose uh, mean will be zero, but its covariance matrix will be exactly that matrix we wrote down, basically, uh, summation of V, V transpose inverse, okay? Over all the rank one matrices for which you took experiments. Okay, this is a simple calculation. It's like, yeah, it's a least square. One can exactly write it down. That's what it is. 
and of course this is my error so basically i could think of this is my theta star my estimate like would be like in, in some sense expect it to be somewhere in this confidence ellipsoid ellipsoid corresponding to this uh, covenis matrix right and what i would like to have is a good confidence i would like this ellipsoid to be small right that's what i would like i would like well, small in a sense what is my choice my choice is what experiments i picked i want the experiments that i picked to make sure this ellipsoid is as small as possible okay and of course this is a, like a ellipsoid uh, so i have to put some norm on it of course one natural thing is to make sure i minimize the volume of this ellipsoid right that's i want okay which is exactly like minimizing the determinant uh, of this inverse uh, because in this case actually things make sense when k is bigger than d l so i assume this matrix is going to be invertible so which is equivalent to maximizing the determinant of the sum of these rank one matrices so this is the case when k is bigger than d if k is d or less than or equal to d and if you kind of uh, generalize the determinant by the element is like elementary symmetric polynomial this is exactly equivalent to the volume of the parallel pipet as well okay just think of the case when k equal to d okay that will be exactly the volume square of the parallel pipet okay so that's this is this model actually generalizes both of those things very naturally you could also say okay hey maybe i want to minimize the average error that i have in my vector which is equivalent to saying the expected norm of this vector which would be exactly trying to minimize the trace of this covenis matrix that will be my expected length of the error that i will get in my estimate you could also say maybe i minimize the maximum variance among all directions okay which would be which is called like these are actually uh in statistics they have this alphabet soup right it's called d optimality a optimality a for average i believe d is for determinant and e optimality this will be you are minimizing the uh variance maximum variance in every direction so maximum minimizing the maximum eigen value right of this matrix so the spectral norm of this matrix and we'll see some of these uh, problems as well okay good uh and of course these are not you can actually ask for other optimality criteria there are a whole uh, set in people statistics look at we, for us i will not do and there's a lot of work in 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 uh, statistic designing algorithms trying to come more general models and so on but that's not the direction we'll go we'll try to just take the simple linear model and try to understand how well what are the algorithms for it and uh, can you actually prove some guarantees about them mostly we'll be concentrating on approximation algorithm trying to prove some worst case guarantees okay so recall this was a more general problem model that i just said and the, the problems already discussed fit this model for a different these functions f and so far i just focus there the problems focus on the cardinality constraint but you could ask for more general constraints as well okay so let me actually uh, uh, talk about some more problems when these vectors are special vectors and for those for us the the most special nicest vectors are then when these vectors corresponds to from come from graphs okay so i like yeah so the setup would be i give you a graph and for every edge i introduce a vector in the r to the v which will be basically the i just orient the graph in arbitrary way and i just take the indicator vector for that vertex for the head minus the tail okay so that's tail minus the head i would just that's what i will do and i then this matrix the sum of the rank one matrix is exactly the laplacian right uh and then i could ask myself okay what are those corresponding objectives and what those those problems that we wrote down what do they mean over here and it turns out those are the problems people have looked at very closely as well over the years so for example uh you can look at the determinant of this matrix well this is not a full rank matrix you have to be careful again the laplacian right is always this issue but let's uh, let's put it on the rug basically it is it just counts the number of spanning trees in the graph right that's exactly the number of spanning trees goes back to kirchhoff and so the problem of picking k like so this problem that we wrote down earlier is exactly the following problem i give you a graph uh, with some number of edges and i want to pick k of them and our goal will be to maximize the number of spanning trees among the subgraph that i formed okay and these problems have been looked uh, earlier this is a special case when f is a determinant there's another very interesting special case uh, which also wrote which is for the when instead of a determinant i go to the trace so trace of this matrix so again this is not invertible i'll uh, i have to be careful i'll take the pseudo inverse uh, just ignore the zero eigen value uh, it turns out actually it is really proportional to the average effective resistance of the graph okay and what is the effective uh, resistance effective resistance is a measure of connectivity how well for any pair or uh, the effective resistance between them is a measure of how well they are connected uh, it's basically the the l2 square norm of the unit flow if i want to send a unit flow from i to j was a minimum energy 
I will minimum energy flow that I will have and the energy of that flow and the energy of the flow is basically dl2 square norm of the flow that I will have. Right? And the nice thing is uh, this kind of nicely interpolates between edge connectivity and shortest path. Right? If this norm was one norm, I want to find a unit flow which has the minimum one norm. That's exactly the shortest path distance between i and j. Okay? And if this was an infinity norm, right? I, right, infinity norm, I want to really send flow as on as split it as much as possible. That's really would be the one over the edge connectivity between this pair. Right? If there are like k disjoint paths between i and j, this would be exactly for the infinity norm will be one over k or square by whatever dip I have. So in some sense, two norm nicely interpolates between those things. It'll be small when you have many short edge disjoint paths intuitively between any two pair. So I right the the problem that we formulated. Uh, earlier to minimize it, like trying to pick k of these edges to minimize the effective resistance. That's what the problem we would have formulated. Right. So if I given a graph and select k edges to minimize the average effective resistance, right? It's a very like natural uh, connectivity problem, network design problem. And this has also been started uh, in literature as well, and this is really the special case of our problem when f is defined to be the trace, uh, where you have to be uh, like appropriately overload the term trace because there's one eigenvalue zero. But let's just ignore that. Good. And of course, you can think of a special case f as the uh, uh, the spectral norm as well, and that's very closely related to finding sparsifiers in my graph as well. I won't go into detail, although, but the results related to this are actually quite. Uh, useful for, for the more general problem as well. Okay, so let me now move on to trying to tell you what are the approaches for the cardinality constraints. So there are quite a few approaches that can be applied and that give results for depending on the different parameters that we have. More, mostly the number of vectors you're picking and the dimension. Those two parameters play the most important role, how well uh, you can actually solve these problems. I must mention all of these problems are actually NP hard, and those reductions are, are not very difficult. So more, all of these, so we really will be focusing on approximation algorithms. So the first set of approach is to use a convex programming approach. So you write a convex relaxation, and the first natural convex relaxation is almost straightforward to write. Uh, Nima actually presented it, some variant of that. So let me just do it actually, special, specialize it for D design, where I want to minimize the determinant of the inverse, or equivalently maximize the determinant because this is a determinant of a d by d matrix. So right scaling is to actually take the dth root of this uh, determinant. That in some sense, that tells you the right uh, scaling of this number. So that's what we are going to do. And of course, you can write the most natural uh, convex relaxation why I introduce uh, a binary variable for every vector, whether I pick it in my set or not. Uh, and of course, then I relax it to say that I only put it upper and lower bounds to, have, to be able to efficiently solve it and I can write my objective in terms of these variables. Right? That's the first relaxation one would write, most natural relaxation for this problem. Uh, and it turns out actually this relaxation is pretty good for the cardinality case. Actually, it's, uh, and there are many different uh, algorithmic approaches. Really, uh, there was a series of work actually going back because this, as I said, it's very related to computing, finding the maximum volume, palopipid, and also like similarly simplex. So there's, it goes back to an old work of Kachian and there have been a series of works since then, but really culminated in this nice work by Nikolov, who gave an E approximation when K is at most D. When a number of vectors you're picking is at most D, well, of course, again, you have to be a bit careful when K is strictly less than D, you have to kind of overload this uh, determinant operator. Uh, later on, we improved the result. When K is bigger than D, you can actually, the whole result generalizes also smoothly, you get an E approximation. Uh, the algorithms are similar, but the analysis need more work. Uh, one nice thing which was noticed by in this very nice paper by Alan Zhu et al, uh, which said that basically as k becomes much larger than the dimension, the problems get simpler and simpler. Okay. So in particular, when k is something like d over epsilon square, you can start getting one plus epsilon approximation. So I think that's something, like if there's one fact about this problem from an algorithmic perspective to keep in mind is this, that as a, the number of vectors that you're picking, uh, it grows large, right? the problem gets simpler and simpler. And they actually build, the, these results build on methods uh, based on Bastian, Spielman, and uh, on grass pacification, basically. Those are the algorithms that they generalize. And these results generalize actually in, essentially for a large, large class of these functions f, not just for the determinant, for many of them as well. So one of the things that we ask is whether this, uh, like, ep, the uh, dependence on epsilon is, is tight or not. 
and it turns out that depends on which f you pick. Okay, so for example, uh, in uh, joint work with uh, G and also with Shashu and Tao, who's also sitting here, uh, we showed basically as for D in particular, you can get a one plus epsilon approximation where K is about D over epsilon plus one over epsilon square. Okay, so to some extent, the at least the uh, in, at least in this result, the the dependence on epsilon is still one over epsilon square, but it's only in the additive sense, not in the multiplicative sense. And all of these results really rely on solving this convex program and using the solution to the convex program, uh, which will be fractional, and trying to come up with a rounding algorithm, trying to convert it into an integer solution by doing some sampling algorithms or trying to even come deterministic algorithms and so on. So all of these approaches relied on that. Yes? What do you know about hardness? So, good. So hardness, uh, good. So when k is at most d, uh, then you can, it's APX hard. Uh, so you cannot get a one plus epsilon approximation. So this E is a constant, but you cannot take it to one, arbitrary one plus epsilon. Uh, so there is one, like 1.01 1 .01 or whatever. Like you cannot get better than that. So, but it's not E, and I don't think so E is the right answer either, but that's what we have so far. So yeah, good. Uh, nice thing is actually, I, uh, in my department, there are a bunch of statisticians as well, and then you go talk to them and tell them these are nice, uh, like the problems that you have, and they use this, and like you can give them these nice rounding algorithms, and you ask them why do you use something like this, and they say no. What they use is simple local search. Okay. So like yeah, uh, which is what they call actually the Fedorov exchange method given by Fedorov, but it's really a simple local search algorithm, and uh, that's the first. If I tell you to design a combinatorial algorithm, it, it might be if not the first, the second one. First might be greedy, but the second one will certainly be local search, uh, right? And uh, so what is the algorithm? Of course, right? Like yeah, you want to pick three vectors, so I'll start with any set, and if you can find a swap, you swap it as long as you're improving your objective. Okay? <coughs> So yeah, if I can exchange them, I keep improving, and then I, I just keep doing it, and it works great in practice, right? And uh, of course, there are always issues with running time of local search, because how many iterations does it take? But in some sense, that really doesn't matter. You could say you only make an improvement if you make an enough improvement. So then you have to argue about near local search optimal solutions. <coughs> So one of the work that we recently did was just try to understand these local search algorithms as well uh, for these objectives. Uh, and uh, the nice thing is they're very simple to implement. They're implemented actually in much of, much of these softwares as well, uh, like SAS and other softwares. Uh, and, but they're not accompanied by any theoretical analysis. Why, like, why do they think they work? And it turns out actually one result we just showed is uh, again with Tao sitting here and Vivek Madan and Z, is that any local optimal solution for at least for D optimal actually is a one plus epsilon approximation where K is at least D plus D over epsilon. In terms of this is a, a much better dependence than actually the previous dependencies we saw using these uh, rounding algorithms. But it turns out actually there is a reason they are actually using these local search algorithms. They work really, really well. Uh, at least even in the worst case, can it, any local optimal solution will be a one plus epsilon approximation as long as k is d over d plus epsilon. So why do the convex relaxation so worse than this, I mean, somehow it's a... Good, actually, the, the con why does it convex? Actually, even the reason this works, the way we show it, is actually via convex relaxations. Okay, so what we show is uh, using a primal dual approach. So we, of course, don't solve it. The, the algorithm is a local search algorithm. How do we show this result? What I'm going to show you, you give me a local optimum solution. I want to show you it is good. What I'm going to do is exhibit you a dual of an of a objective within 1 plus epsilon. Right? Okay, and that will show you. Let me just... I think of on the number line, right? I'm, I, right? This is my convex programming op optimum, right? The integral optimum is somewhere below, right? And our local optimum is even below that one, right? Like this is, I guess, zero to infinity, right? Whatever, right? I'm, my objective is increasing in that direction. I'm maximizing. This is my determinant. Local optimum is somewhere over here. So what the way we show it is basically all the dual feasible solutions are somewhere on this line, right? This is the mid, like dual is a minimization problem. This is the optimum convex program. There's strong duality. All the feasible duals are somewhere over here. I'll just show basically a feasible dual using your local optimum. Give me a local optimum. Using the local optimum, I'll construct you a feasible dual such that this ratio is no more than one plus epsilon, right? As long as k is bigger. Okay? So, and that, uh, that will basically show all of these ratios are no more than one plus epsilon, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's the same convex program as good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's the same convex program. So it's really all the local search intuitively. Of course, there could be other reasons why it's working, but theoretically, we can prove it. Why it works is basically still 
but problem problem somehow in the rounding in the other case ah uh, so ah uh, no actually yes maybe i removed a few slides about it as well uh, so you can actually like uh, yeah so you should be able to prove a better bound it's these are a bounds you prove it's not that they they are tight no, no. the right answer should be the same uh, we just don't have the right rounding algorithm or actually we have a class of rounding algorithms i done some conjecture which i removed because i wanted to uh, like cover the other part as well but yes uh, uh, there should be better rounding algorithms we just don't know what they are So yeah, so basically yeah, so the, the, the even the proof of this a very combinatorial statement and this is quite uh, like yeah, if like the technique is quite standard in uh, approximation algorithms called dual fitting, right? You're trying to fit a dual to your primal solution, although which has no idea what the convex program is, but it's just a method of analysis. Uh, and it turns out even if actually if you code it up and, and uh, uh, the trying to solve a convex program, and that's really the bottleneck in almost even a lot of these algorithms, uh, when the rounding algorithms are usually very fast, but solving the convex program takes a lot of time. And that's one of the reasons why uh, they use these simple combinatorial algorithms, because determinant and so on, these are not very nice objectives. Uh, for convex programs to deal with. Okay, so yeah, uh, similar but weaker results also hold for the other objective of trace as well. Uh, so where the dependence on epsilon is not as good as the convex programming bound and so on, and you have to do some pre-processing, like they hold only, yeah, some pre-processing as well, but yeah, like the spirit of the statements is still that you local search algorithms asymptotically perform really, really well as well. Okay, so, so in the last, uh, last 10, 15 minutes, I just want to briefly touch on uh, partition constraints as well and where we'll see where naturally stable polynomials actually will uh, show up uh, when we try to write, uh, try to round, like get some good algorithms for these problems, okay? So I'll try to give you some idea. Why do they naturally show up actually? Okay, so partition constraints actually, yeah, of course you could do more general uh, metroid constraints as well, but partition constraints are quite nice. And I'll before going to the result, I want to just give you one uh, very nice reduction uh, where partition constraints, although they are not explicitly there in the problem, but they, then you can model your problem as with partition constraints. And that's typically the, the, I would say, the most natural application of partition constraints and which are in allocation problems. So, right, so this is a problem which uh, Nima also talked about, but I just wanted to briefly mention it again, just to show you this reduction between allocation problems and partition constraints, okay? So what is the problem? Uh, so think of any allocation problem. So here we are taking a problem where the input is some n players. I have n players, m, m items, so number of items is more, and each player has a certain value for each item. So vij is the value that I, player i receives for if I give him item j. And what I want to find is assignment. I want to assign these all the items to these players. Uh, and you can ask what is my objective. You can have multiple objectives that are given. One is actually the Santa Claus. Maybe look at the Santa Claus problem. So Santa Claus actually wants to make sure that the least happy kid is as happy as possible. Okay? Because he cares about the least happy. He wants to make all the kids very happy. So what you're going to do is uh, you want to maximize. Okay, I lost a min over here. So there should be maximize overall sigma. There should be a min over i over here, which I've lost. Uh, so minimum overall players, the, the, the happiness of a kid, which the happiness of the kid for him is that we are assuming additive valuation. If I give him a bundle, he'll, the kid will just sum of the values for the uh, items he's received. That will be, the, this is the valuation of the ith kid and we have to, have, we should have a min i over here. So you, since you exchanged i and j, right? Uh, did I exchange i and j? No, so I'm summing over all j such that uh, sigma j equal to y, thank you, yes. This I just added last night, which I guess I shouldn't That's have. in the previous one. Yeah, yes. It also in the previous one, correct. Both of these, yes. So basically, these are, this will be the, bunch, the values of the bundle that was assigned to the i-th player. So it should be sigma j equal to y. And the Sunash social welfare, we look at the geometric mean, okay? Rather than, the, if you look at the sum, that's trivial. I'll just assign the item to the player who values is the most, right? But we really either make sure that the, uh, I want to assign items who, to the players who value them, as well as uh, every player should get something, and Nash Social Welfare seems to do that. Santa Claus tried to go for the worst uh, player. Uh, okay. In terms of both of these problems, actually can't be modeled in our model with partition constraints. Okay. So I just want to briefly just tell you how that reduction goes, and we'll talk about some algorithms. So what we do is basically we'll introduce one vector for each pair. Okay, for each item and each player, I'm going to introduce a vector uij. 
the vector uij will be basically will have only one non-zero coordinate right it will be the so this vector will be in the rn where there are n players so will be right okay so I have, it's a vector in the player dimension and uh, it will be basically square root because of the scaling purposes it will be the square root of the value of this item for this player okay and it turns out if you Assume this, then if you calculate our function on the corresponding matrices we wrote earlier, for the determinant, we get this natural social welfare, and for Santa Claus, it's really the spectral norm. Right? For the diagonal matrices, right, the, the, it's, I'm really looking at the, the spectral norm of the inverse as really the minimum entry, right? That's really what I'm going after in some sense, right? Uh, yeah. What are the partitions? Good, and then we'll, we'll also work about how do we introduce a partition constraint, is that for each item, each for each of my items, I will introduce a partition constraint of all the vectors associated with it that you can only pick one of, of one of them because I can assign each item only to one of the players. So each item has one. Okay, maybe I should have a picture somewhere. So good. These are my items. So these are my valuations, right? So for this, for this item uh, and person pair, I have a vector which is this one. And for this one, I also have another vector, which is this one, because for the second player, it's, the value is five. And because this item can only go to this one or this one, I'll say, okay, among these two vectors, you can only pick one of them in your solution. Among these two vectors, you can only pick one of them. Among these two vectors, you can only pick one of them. Okay. And once you pick those, you actually put it in our framework. Actually, for the determinant, it will become exactly uh, the natural social welfare problem. And for the Santa Claus, it will become, of, like, yeah, for the spectral norm, it will become the Santa Claus problem. And both of these problems have been very well studied, uh, both national social welfare as well as uh, Santa Claus uh, problem uh, over the years. But uh, because they naturally fit in a framework, that actually uh, allows us to get a bunch of results if you can solve our problem for partition constraints. Okay, so so let me just briefly mention you uh, a result that I, this is with Shasho that actually there'll be for the maximum determinant. So that for determinant objective, uh, for the more general partition constraint, you can always get a one over E approximation. Okay. Right. So I have a bunch of partitions. There in the partition, we were picking just one one vector, but you can generalize it more generally. You pick BI, and uh, I want to pick a basis such that I maximize my determinant or minimize the inverse of the determinant. Of course, I take the appropriate root, uh, and that's what you will get. So, uh, okay, we have about 10 minutes. Okay, good. So I'll basically tell you a polynomial relaxation. In some sense, uh, it's bit I feel it's slightly easier to understand in this. Like, of course, there's a general machinery uh, of using like uh, um, lock and care polynomials and so on, which also like generalizes some of many of these things. But it's cleaner to just see how the pol polynomial relaxation comes up and what's really is going on. Okay, so let's try to write down a convex relaxation. The first one you write down, you say, okay, I'll try to generalize what we had earlier. We had a relaxation for cardinality constraint. Why don't I just write generalize that, right? Because I'll just change my constraints. So rather than writing out the constraints on x that you pick k of them, I'll say from each partition you pick as many you're supposed to pick. Right? I'll pick bi number of vectors from partition pi. Right? That's the number, that's a constraint I'll pick, and each x is between 0 and 1. Objective, I can still write it in terms of our old objective. For simplicity, I just got rid of this, the roots and so on, 1 over dth root. Uh, one problem with this is actually this cannot detect the answer is 0 versus non-zero. Okay? And if you think for a moment uh, in this... Uh, allocation problem, the answer in zero versus non-zero actually is a very simple, it's a matching problem. Okay, if I want to check out whether, let's say, can I assign items to players such that any of these objectives, national social welfare or, or the, uh, the Santa Claus objective is non-zero, that can only happen if every player can get an item with who, who he values it as a non-zero value. So what I should just look at is a support graph of the non-zero values Right and check whether there is a matching which covers all the players. If, if the answer is bipart like which is which you can just solve by bipartite matching problem. If the answer is yes, yes, then if there is such a the answer is non-zero. If that's no, the answer is zero. Right. So that you can detect in polynomial time. And the problem is this convex program cannot do that. So it can even return you a non-zero answer, although the right answer could be zero. Okay. And how do you uh, now uh, alleviate this problem? Is basically you strengthen this convex program. And what you do is do a scaling. Uh, kind of a thing which is quite um, like common in matrix scaling kind of approaches and so on. Uh, so what you do, uh, good, so you could, what I do is actually I'll introduce a new variable yE, 
which you should think of is basically I'm scaling the item E or like our vector E for myself. Okay, so of course I, I'll, maybe I'll scale down some of the valuations for some players, right? It's, of course, you can't allow myself to do arbitrary scaling because then you'll just drive down the objective to zero. I want to make sure I do such a scaling that my integral optimum does not change, but my fractional optimum, fractional solutions objective, uh, need naturally goes down. Okay, that's the kind of scaling. So how do I ensure that? Like constraints on p would be still the same, but the constraint on my scalings that I would do is that if I look at the product of the scalings for every feasible solution, that remains that is equal to one. And if you ensure this, then it's not very hard to see, and we'll quickly see it as well. Then, for every integer solution, I'm doing such a scaling, and I'm here I'm using really the fact that the determinant is a polynomial, uh, can be expressed as a polynomial, that for every integer solution, the objective does not change, but by doing the scaling, my actually I get, because I'm minimizing over all possible scalings, my objective actually for the convex program could go down, and then it might be able to get zero versus one zero. Okay, and it can do that. As well. So let's see. Uh, firstly, of course, the question is how do I solve this? That's uh, not uh, very hard to see. Uh, this function is actually in x, it's log and k that we know, but in not in y, but in log y, it's actually log convex, which is great for us because our constraints are actually linear in log y. So at least you can solve this uh, polynomial optimization problem. Right? Actually, I really want to think of this as a polynomial optimization problem. It's a polynomial in both x and y. But in x, this function is log concave, because the determinant is log concave. But in log y, the function is actually log convex, because all the coefficients are non-negative. Yeah? So it's also a special case in y. These are what is also called geometry programs. So why is this a relaxation? So which, as I said, like basically I'm saying for every integer solution, if I, the, the objective that will come out of it will, will be still larger than the integer solution. If I, if I set x to be the integer solution, indicator vector for the integer solution, it doesn't matter what y you will pick, I'll still get the value of the integer solution. Okay, let's verify that. So let b be your optimal basis, or the optimal answer. So of course, the optimal value is the determinant of just summation v, v transpose uh, overall, which I denote by lbb. So x star is just indicator vector of like this thing. So if f x star y, doesn't matter what y you pick in, x star will become zero or one. Right? So I'll just restrict myself to the one vectors, which are vectors in B, Y E times V E V transpose. For simplicity over here, I'm assuming actually that, like, yeah, that uh, the size of the base is exactly the D, which is the set of the dimension. This, so this, this as a polynomial in Y, this is in each Y E, this is a linear polynomial because these are rank one matrices. And this is a degree D polynomial and they are D of these terms. So it'll become exactly Y to the B times this objective. And my constraint that I'm placing on, on Q is exactly this as one. So this is a relaxation. And of course, like it might look like magic, but these are kind of things which are also used in matrix scaling and so on. That's really the, the approach is to get stronger relaxations as well for over there as well to, let's say, for approximating the permanent. And it turns out actually algorithmic, like I'll use some simple algorithms where like inequalities which come out of matrix scaling can also be used for these problems to get uh, analyze the algorithms. Okay, so what is the algorithm? Algorithm is actually a very simple one. Okay, and uh, what you just like solve this convex relaxation, you ignore y, you just look at x. x fractionally assigns you, picks the right amount of vectors from each partition. You just think of those as probability distributions by after scaling. So if you pick bi elements, I scale uh, from part i, I just scale the fraction solution by bi in that part, and I now have a probability distribution, I sample uh, bi times from that distribution. Yeah? Can we go back to the previous one? So I'm a bit confused by the set Q. So um, yeah. does it, doesn't that mean that every Y will be, every Y E will be um, one? So why if, if that's a feasible, one possible solution, but that's not necessary. I mean, un unless, unless there are some, I mean, unless Good. there are some zero vectors. But, uh, yeah. No, so if for example, what you can show in the partition constraints, all the Y variables for all the elements in the same partition. So, so by basis, you mean basis of metroid? Of the metroid. In this matching case, I have variables on the edges, right? My, my like edges are my uh, vectors, right, on my graph. So all the edges incident at a particular vertex on one side will be the same. But, but I mean, so, so when, you, when, you, when you take two bases of, of that metroid, um, you can, I mean, by, by exchanges, they can, 
You can always have two adjacent bases that are different by only Good. one. Good, yes, one. except you should have connectivity in that space, which you don't have actually in this particular right. case. Right, so you can, okay, so you can partition over, yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So yes. That, those are the kind of things I we also use for analysis. And that, but yes, that actually, what you really need is over here is greater than or equal to one. Over here, because for like I just want this for relaxation, and this need to be greater than or equal to one. But for this particular partition constraints, equality one also you can enforce, which is a, a weaker relaxation, but it still works. So, so, so how do you? I mean, in here, uh, you have a lot of constraints, right? Correct. Yes, I have a lot of constraints, but uh, like of course in Q, I really firstly I have to do this change of variables. I go to log of y, mm -hmm. then these are uh, basically then this is the linear constraints oh, over all bases, and then this is you can uh, optimize because you can separate separation over them is just a minimum weight basis yeah, yeah. in my uh, yeah. for the matroid. Right? Yes. Good. So the algorithm is the first algorithm you would do, randomized rounding. I scale it, and I just do enough to coin tosses. Uh, so how do I analyze it? Uh, the way to analyze it is basically now go back to this polynomial, I basically where I plug in the, put in the, in my objective, the integral of, or sorry, the optimum fraction solution for x bar, x bar, y I don't know, right? Y I've optimized over, like taken a minimum over all such scalings. But I now look, think of it actually as a polynomial in y, again. Okay? And I like expand it out, it'll have certain coefficients, like if uh, right, maybe this should be a D, I'm changing between D and R, but this will be a, uh, like a degree D polynomial, or degree R polynomial, if these were R by R matrices. And if I just look at what it is, op star is actually just an optimization problem with this polynomial. It's a minimum of P of Y over all scalings, right? Because outer problem X bar I fixed. It's my optimum fraction solution is exactly this value. Okay, and what is the expected value of the algorithm? You can try to write down what it is, the expansion. Actually, it turns out it's just a collection, like up to a scaling, is sum of bunch of the coefficients of this polynomial. Okay. In particular, those, in the polynomial, it will be all the multilinear terms for these, like which corresponds to the basis of my, I just look at the, the coefficients which corresponds to not all subsets, because here I have all subsets of the particular size, but those are not all feasible because they don't satisfy partition constraints. I only look at the terms which corresponds to, which satisfy the partition constraints. That's my objective, actually. So I have to relate these two, and uh, basically what we show is that uh, this is not like this polynomial, like yeah, this is very special, but you can actually prove inequality. We want to show this is large as compared to this one, right? Uh, a sum of bunch of coefficients is large as compared to minimizing a, a certain uh, optimization over the polynomial, but we show this holds for more general class of real stable polynomials. Okay? So the inequality, and this really relies on generalizes uh, the result of Gurwitz, which basically uh, showed exactly such a thing when the, the metroid was very, very special in some sense. That's how one way to think about it. And you get the right kind of things. Okay, the details are, are, are not very, but like a like lot of these things have been generalized, as I mentioned as well. So you can also like improve it to natural social welfare, where Nima talked about. Uh, we can get the same kind of bounds for natural social welfare as well. Uh, later, like uh, Anari and Garan, and also Strajak and Vishnoi generalizes to a uh, larger class of matroids, and uh, at least, uh, like, yeah, and almost all the matroids you can get using the machinery of completely locked in Kirchhoff polynomials for the determinant objective. Right, the heavy look at the determinant objective and partition constraints. Okay, I'm almost uh, running out of time, so let me br briefly mention to you some uh, uh, the other objective that we are looking at, which was the E design, like which is the maximizing the minimum eigenvalue of the matrix, which is equivalent to minimizing the maximum eigenvalue of the inverse. Right, so I just uh, and again, again under the partition constraints. And here again, I want to just tell you that the the the, the, the machine your stable polynomials naturally comes up again. For some of partition constraints or general matroids, they naturally come up as well. So, so what is the problem? I give you a bunch of these vectors and a bunch of partitions. For simplicity, just assume I'm going to pick one one vector from each part, and I want to make sure I look at the matrix that we formed. I want to make I want to maximize the minimum eigenvalue of it of this matrix, which is same as minimizing the maximum eigenvalue of the inverse, right? Up to just the ratio. So the, what we can show, this is uh, resolved with uh, Vivek and uh, Shasho and Tao sitting here, is that you can write a natural relaxation again, like which is the first relaxation you will write. Its integrality gap is actually at most one plus epsilon if all the vectors are small. Small compared to the optimal objective. Which is a slightly weird condition, but as you will see, this is not such a, this is a natural condition which is used in many, uh, like, you might have seen earlier is there is a very nice result by Marcus Schilman Silvastov which says the following if I have a bunch of let's say some bunch of random vectors who sum them to identity 
right? And all these vectors are actually small. Then I can pick one, one, like I, there is instantiation of these vectors such that the maximum eigenvalue will be not too large. And it turns out our result is in a very similar flavor, except we have to maximize the minimum eigenvalue. This is minimizing the maximum eigenvalue, okay? So one has to actually go through the proof and most of the proof generalizes, some part do not, which we have to change. So what the main uh, lemma we show, essentially under the sim similar assumptions, you can also prove that the minimum eigenvalue will also be very close uh, to one. Okay, that there is an instantiation such that the minimum eigenvalue, and this lemma essentially implies uh, after a simple reduction, the, where does the distribution come in? Well, the distribution comes in from the solution of the convex relaxation, okay. which will be for each part, I will have a distribution because I have to pick one vector. Uh, so of course I can't, my fraction solution will pick fractionally, which is really a probability distribution. Okay. And, uh, and uh, really how, how do these proofs uh, go by? Really, they really use stable polynomials and interlacing uh, in it. Uh, the part where we have to modify the previous arguments are these uh, multivariate barrier arguments in it, which need some careful uh, changes so that they, the proofs still go through where we are looking for trying to maximize the minimum eigenvalue. But uh, just I would say like, yeah, so these are results in progress. The clarity what we have so far is, is not that much and something we are trying to work out what happens in the general case and so on. Okay, so, yeah. Not sure if I understand. So, so can you get both at the same time? Like they are? Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Will let me see. I'm not completely sure. We What's didn't. Uh, I know there are results at least in the uh, in the spectral sparse fair where you can get both sided bounds. Uh, here we didn't try. Like I, I'm not sure. Yeah, like the proofs are quite uh, brittle, so I'm not sure whether both of them we can go no. at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so let me just conclude and say, like I just introduced your diversity measure, which is based on spectral properties of natural vectors associated with the items. And for cardinality constraint, I would want to say, basically, we understand uh, how well these problems uh, can be solved, both from a convex programming approach and as well as combinatorial algorithms work. And we kind of understand to a significant extent how well they work. Uh, for more general constraints of partition and metroid constraints, uh, I must mention all of these algorithms I said they are actually non-algorithmic. Although I gave algorithm, the, like I only analyze its expected value. And these are exponential kind of bounds. And the second one is anyway completely non-algorithmic. So these are not algorithmic approaches. But what they show is that the convex program will get you a number which is close to the optimum. So I can estimate the value of the problem, but I actually cannot find the solution uh, efficiently right now, which is quite, uh, I would say, unsatisfactory or like uh, interesting depending on how you look at it. Uh, so most of like, yeah, so it, it, but it's a very natural open problem how to actually get algorithms, convert these results into algorithms. Okay, I like that. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Objections? Mm -hmm. Any other comments? So you said that uh, maximizing the determinant is a difficult problem. I mean, it's convex and whatever. If you maximize the log of the debt yes. determinant, that's actually, it's, you have some simple constraints, like non-negativity and the summation equal yeah. to k. So if you maximize the log debt. Yes, that's what you do finally, yes. Yeah, yeah, you can actually do it, but still, like it runs into numerical issues very quickly and so on, yeah. Even so the log that. Even log that, yeah. Like we could, it works out, like I'm not saying, but it takes some time, significant time. Once your matrices go by, I don't know what, 50 by 50 uh, and so on. Uh, like, yeah, uh, it wasn't quite like, yeah, they, it did, like they, they take much longer than uh, comparing to, let's say, we run local search algorithms and so on. Local search algorithms were pretty fast as well, like, yeah. Uh, of course, you can try to even do first order methods and so on. People have even tried to work that out, how well they work and so on, but their convergence is not that great uh, as well, like both theoretically and practically. So if you're trying to maximize the least eigenvalue, um, that's un do, do you know that local search fails even under a further assumption like the vectors aren't too long or something like that? For ca like, so local search or these kind of arguments only work for cardinality constraints? Right, uh, not for metroid, just to, like yeah, for yeah, metroid, for cardinality constraints. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. So you just have one or two half the vectors. That uh, yeah, okay. So even for the trace, which I kind of skipped over, I, I so the, there also the vectors, uh, the, the local search only works actually as long as the vectors are small and not yeah, too so long. That's what I mean. If the vectors are small, small do you uh, know that it fails at least eigenvalue? Could that be a. 
Yeah, possibly. Like it can only work when the vectors are small. Okay. Uh, in at least in for the trace objective, we can actually do a simple pre-processing. If the vectors are long, we can actually shorten them without changing the objective too much. So you can make the vector small and then do local search. So you can actually run local search by doing a simple pre-processing. About the uh, yeah, for uh, we tried a bit, we didn't really have a clarity either this way or that way. Yeah. I guess from local search, if you do the biggest improvement, you can show that the number of iterations is, is the number of local improvements is. Is small, right? So, so of course, the local improvements, like it's all problems with almost all local search algorithms. So that's uh, the, you will not be able to give up a normal bound. But then you just do a simple approximate local search. I'll only make an improvement if my improvement is large enough, and then uh, the same proofs goes through even for you will want to get a local optimum. Couldn't you, couldn't you in this case, I mean, since you have a again you have a metroid uh, type uh, structure that you could say that. Like we are looking at even cardinality constraint, but yes, uh, over there also. Right, but I mean, if if you look at the optimum solution, then uh, there will be a swap. Correct. Yes. Improves by. Yeah. Correct. By large, uh, the objectives are not linear, but yes, uh, but there is clearly. So one thing I did not mention in this class, at least for the determinant. Once you go to log that, actually that's you can think of it as a set function as well. Over the which set you pick is that's actually a submodular function, and there's been a lot of work on maximizing submodular function. Uh, subject to cardinality and metroid constraints, which use similar arguments that kind of, uh, yes, local search arguments that you are suggesting. Many of those arguments don't directly apply over here because our, once you take the log, the function is not necessarily non-negative. Actually, it can even go to minus infinity depending on which vectors you pick because the determinant could be zero. Uh, but yeah, but okay, I haven't thought so hard on it, but that's an uh, interesting uh, thought, yes, because those are the kind of arguments you use for local search for maximizing some other functions. Okay, let's uh, thank Moit again. So we have a quick break for seven minutes.